You believe it will be inevitable that there will be forced conflict. We've got a significantly increased defence. A once-in-a-generation look at whether our ADF is fit for purpose. The United States will go to war if necessary in order to protect Taiwan. Of course, we have alliance obligations. What we don't have is strike capabilities. The Chinese PLA has 975,000 troops. How long, realistically, could you hold them off? We will fight as long as it takes. Victory is anything but assured. Are we ready for war? We are acting as quickly as we can. I pray that they will get it right. It's been just over eight decades since war came to Australia. Since then, we've fought and died in many a battle all far from home. So can it happen again? Yes. With China's continuing push into the Western Pacific, the prospect of conflict in our region has never been higher, which raises some very real questions. Can Australia defend itself? And are we ready for war? ready for war? I don't think we are. We've got a time period now where we must prepare for the worst case. We would probably be looking at losses that we haven't seen since the Second World War. Some of Australia's finest military minds are worried. This is a national challenge that Australia has. Former Major General Mick Ryan is one of them. We face a range of cyber, economic, informational, political, diplomatic and military challenges with the coercion of the Chinese Communist Party that are well beyond anything we've seen before. It is a national challenge, not just a military one. And former Major General, the late Senator Jim Molan, shares that concern. Because we've fundamentally been at peace for 80 years, Many people find a serious war beyond their comprehension. Ask the Ukrainians. And people have often said to me, China wouldn't be that stupid, would they? Ask the Russians. Jim, there's been a recent shift in tone coming from China. Do you truly believe that the relationship is thawing? No, I don't believe the relationship is thawing because the issues for China are far, far bigger than a simple relationship with Australia. Finally, allow me to propose a toast. It's been a long time between drinks for Beijing and Canberra. If we can have a glass of wine or drink in your hands, otherwise... Uh... In 2023, Chinese Ambassador to, uh... Zhao Quan was toasting the new year with a glass of Australian red. To your health, to the friendship between China and Australia. Cheers. The Ambassador was blunt. A change of government in Canberra has led to a changed relationship with Beijing. We had a turnaround last year. Turnaround from falling down, from falling behind to stability. And from stability, perhaps to improvement, upholding and even development. And in 2014, it was President Xi Jinping raising a glass Cheers. to then Prime Minister Tony Abbott. Back then, our relationship with China was at an all-time high. Trade was booming. Our leaders were talking, and then it all unraveled big time. From national security issues to those trade sanctions that were brought on by the Morrison government calling out China over COVID, the relationship hit rock bottom. And even though recently there's been a thawing of tensions, there is still one issue that looms large, and it's one Australia can't avoid, Taiwan. On Formosa, renamed Taiwan, Nationalist China is ready. Taiwan separated from Communist China in 1949, and it's been a fraught and uncertain relationship ever since. Have made Communist China an emerging superpower. Now, it's potentially the greatest flashpoint in global politics, and one that could have the greatest impact on the rest of the world.
The issues for China are enormous at the moment. China wants to be the dominant power in our region and China wants to reincorporate Taiwan into the People's Republic of China. October 2022, and it was a big welcome for a big occasion. Xi Jinping was the star attraction at the 20th Communist Party Congress in Beijing. As expected, the week-long event saw him win a third term as leader. Among his many stated goals, taking back Taiwan. The resolution of the Taiwan issue is a Chinese matter for us Chinese people to decide. We insist on striving for the prospect of peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and with the greatest effort. However, we are not committed to abandoning the use of force. She has become a leader who has basically developed the goal that China is going to become the predominant power in the world. And I think that represents trouble for both Australia and the United States. As a former congressman and White House chief of staff, Leon knows how to lead, which is why he is held in such high esteem, not only in this city, but around the world. Leon Panetta served under Barack Obama as Secretary of Defense. Thank you, Mr. President. His relationship with Xi Jinping dates back to 2012, the year before he took the top job in China. What troubles you most about him moving forward, given your experience with him in the past? I think it's unpredictability. <laughs> uh, the fact that uh, we all thought that he would uh, be a much more uh, responsible leader in China and has turned out to be much more autocratic uh, has raised real concerns about uh, the, uh, the predictability of where he wants to go. China is now more powerful than ever, but it also has a lot more at stake. Because if President Xi Jinping delivers on his promise, just like Vladimir Putin did to Ukraine, Xi will have to destroy the very thing he covets, and that's Taiwan itself. Because reunification will come at a significant cost. Xi Jinping has said expressly that he wants Taiwan to be part of Greater China now. How do you think he'd do it? How do you think he'd take it? Well, he's said it on many, many occasions. I mean, uh, people talk about grey zone warfare. There's nothing grey in his statements. They're very mm. black and white. He wants Taiwan back, and he wants to do it in his lifetime. Mm. It's, it's his manifest destiny in many respects. That destiny rests on Xi reigning supreme in China. On the eve of the party congress that re-elected him, former Chinese leader Hu Jintao was removed from the event, seen by many as another power play by the president. Xi Jinping assumed his uh, presidency uh, in the third term in a process that is not transparent. Mm. And uh, he basically tried to eliminate all his political opponent. I've come to the capital, Taipei, to meet with the man who has the toughest job in international diplomacy. Good morning. Good to see you in person. Good to see you in person, too. Thank you for your time. I've been looking forward to talking to you uh, since we last spoke, actually. Oh, yeah. Oh. Joseph Wu is Taiwan's foreign minister. In this moment, how are relations between Taiwan and China? Uh, not very good. Uh, you can probably uh, flashback to August when Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan and the Chinese just reacted disproportionately uh, through its military might. They also fired their missiles over Taiwan and uh, they also conducted disinformation campaign, cognitive warfare and also economic coercion against Taiwan. And we haven't fully recovered. And the Chinese tactics is trying to create a new normal. So what is the status quo now? Uh, the status quo is that uh, Taiwan is a democracy and Taiwan and China do not have uh, jurisdiction over each other. But Ambassador Zhao says that's simply not the case. 
In this world, there's only one China, and now the People's Republic of China is representing the whole of China. And Taiwan was part of China and is still part of China. This is truly a David and Goliath scenario. Taiwan has a population of 24 million. China, 1.4 billion. And the two are just 160 kilometres apart. Separated by one of the most important shipping lanes in the world, the Taiwan Strait. Recently, there has been a shift in tone from President Xi Jinping. What do you put that down to? Uh, he said several things. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the Chinese officials, especially the uh, foreign policy officials, uh, need to dare to struggle. And to us, that seems to be quite alarming. And he also put it in his work report, uh, the Taiwan belongs to the Chinese people. And he also said that uh, uh, China would never promise to renounce the use of force against Taiwan. So if you put all this together, China seems to be uh, preparing for uh, a military assault against Taiwan. This is not just speculation on the part of Joseph Wu. He points to the dramatic increase in China's military presence in Taiwanese territory. If you look at uh, China's long-term military trajectory, uh, it's been threatening Taiwan more and more and more. Uh, in 2020, uh, they have about 380 sorties of their military airplane. And in 2021, they had 970 of them. And for this year, they already have uh, 2,700 uh, sorties. Uh, violating our uh, immediate vicinity. So this kind of uh, military threat is increasing. And we are concerned that China might feel that uh, they are confident enough to use military force against Taiwan without too much opposition. And if they have that kind of confidence, they may attack Taiwan at any time. We've been patiently waiting for more than seven decades, more than seven decades. And we've been waiting peacefully for peaceful relocation. We have always thought that the Chinese timeline for incorporating Taiwan by force or by other means was maybe about within four years from now. The year 2027 holds great significance for President Xi. It will be the 100th anniversary of the People's Liberation Army. It could also see him re-elected to an unprecedented fourth term as leader. Is Taiwan ready for war? Uh, well, I do not think that we are ready for war right now, but uh, definitely we are about to be ready for war. Dr. Lei Chung is the director of Taiwan's Department of Chinese Affairs. He says the government is workshopping all possible plans by Beijing. We are talking about the um, Chinese, uh, the uh, air force, and also the uh, blockade by the sea. Uh, those are the things that are very possible uh, employed by China uh, to uh, cut off Taiwan from our fuel, our energy, and also the food resources and all those. Oh, despite that, uh, we are uh, preparing for the stockpile uh, to uh, meet the situation like those. And you're preparing for that now? Yeah, we have to prepare for everything. From their fighter jets at the Shinchu Air Base to their warships at sea. It appears that Taiwan is preparing for the worst. And make no mistake, they'll be coming up against the biggest military force in the world. The Chinese PLA has 975,000 troops at its disposal. Taiwan's got roughly 90,000, give or take, is that right? Uh, we have uh, 150,000 150, uh, military personnel. 150,000, as and opposed to a million, though? Uh, opposed to a million, yes. Just a fraction. If, if you look at the sheer number, of course, that is a contrast. So, but for the Chinese, 
uh, to be able to uh, transport their military personnel over the Taiwan Strait, and the ships crossing the water uh, can be a target. Even after all of that, if Xi's forces manage to get on the ground here, what comes next is arguably the hardest part, urban warfare. Taiwan is one of the most densely populated parts of the world where street fights would have to take place through these narrow alleyways and built up neighbourhoods. If history's taught us anything, victory is anything but assured. If it comes down to urban warfare, how long realistically could you hold them off? Uh, we don't uh, try to calculate how long we can last. Uh, the determination is that uh, we will fight as long as it takes. What sort of help will you need? Uh, the need will be for us to continue to stockpile the ammunition and weapons that we uh, need uh, for Taiwan self-defense, and we have been uh, doing that right now. Do you have concerns that American weapons at the moment are going to Ukraine, leaving you short, perhaps? Uh, we have seen reports on that, uh, but we are engaging in very serious discussions with the U.S. side to make sure that the weapons are in steady supply to Taiwan. I do not think there's any imminent attempt on the part of China to invade Taiwan. At the G20 meeting in Indonesia, Joe Biden met with his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping. I didn't find him more confrontational or more conciliatory. I found him the way he's always been, direct and straightforward. What should... But China three months earlier, the US president was just as direct when questioned about Taiwan in a primetime interview in America. Would US forces defend the island? Yes, if in fact there was an unprecedented attack. So unlike Ukraine, to be clear, sir, US forces, US men and women, would defend Taiwan in the event of a Chinese invasion? Yes. Well, President Biden has made very clear that the United States uh, would, in fact, move to defend Taiwan and deploy our military forces uh, into Taiwan in order to protect them. I think that pretty much makes clear that the United States will, in fact, go to war if necessary in order to protect Taiwan. Which brings us to a critical point for Australia. Where do we stand if the US ends up with a war on its hands over Taiwan? If the US goes in, do we then have to? I think it would be extraordinarily difficult for Australia not to. I mean, the United States has invested decades in this relationship. Uh, Australian geography alone makes us a really critical partner to the United States in any Taiwanese contingency because it is almost impossible to conceive that such a conflict would be restricted to Taiwan. If China takes Taiwan, do we have to go in? That's a question for the government of the day. Of course, we have alliance obligations with the United States. We don't have a closer security partner than, than the United States. We fought and, uh, you know, bled together over the last century. We face very complex strategic circumstances and the world is much more fragile now than it has been for a long time. That, that is the reality of the world in which we are living. And we are seeing a great power contest. And from a man who had seen his fair share of military action, joining forces with America will come at a cost. The most basic expectation is that we share the burden and the biggest burden is casualties. If you're going to fight beside the Americans, you, you, you will take casualties. So whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or in a future Taiwan scenario, uh, there will be significant casualties. And they know who their allies are that are prepared to really stand shoulder to shoulder with them. And that's the key thing. Would it be World War Three? Are we talking about World War Three? I think it would be. Oh, yeah. 
conflict between the United States and China would be nothing short of catastrophic. They will neutralise the Americans, dominate the Western Pacific. Australia could be the next target. The last time conflict came to our shores was during World War II. Japan and Germany were on the move. The attacks were a surprise. Submarines, warships, fighter planes hit our ships and military operations. It was a major wake-up call for Australia, and one that should be remembered. 1941, off the coast of Western Australia, a German warship sunk the HMAS Sydney. All 645 sailors perished. And on the 19th of February, 1942, Japan unleashed an air assault across northern Australia. From Exmouth in the west to Townsville in the east, nearly 100 air raids were flown. Darwin was hit hardest. Over 230 people lost their lives with hundreds more wounded. It's a part of our history that modern day China is all too happy to remind us of. During the Second World War, Japan invaded Australia, bombed Darwin, killed Australians, and uh, in that, uh, and then treated the Australian POWs in a way that was humanely unacceptable. And the Japanese government has not apologized for that. They don't apologize, it means they don't accept it's wrong. And then, in my repeat, the history. Contrary to Zhao Chen's rewriting of history, Japan did make an apology. China's ambassador to Australia recently said for Canberra to be wary of Japan and that Japan could even attack Australia again one day. What do you think's behind that? How did you react to that? Well, no, I have no intention to, you know, respond to any specific comment, you know, made by my Chinese counterpart, because I don't think it's productive. But that said, you know, this is a time for dialogue. This is no time for mutual, mutual recrimination. Yamagami Shingo is Japan's ambassador to Australia. He says Tokyo is well aware of the formidable difficulties that lie ahead. If you look at the security environment surrounding Japan, there is no denying it's getting, you know, very severe and deteriorating. And we need to enhance our deterrence. We need to enhance our capabilities to respond to contingency. The end game here is the prospect of war. Oh, yeah. If China makes a move on Taiwan. Given the strength of China, given what we've got, given the allies that we've got, what would war look like in this region? I think it'd be far worse than anything in the 20th century. Far worse. Would it be World War Three? Would we be talking about World War Three? I think it would be, which is why we've got to maintain the peace. Mm. We've got to talk. We've got to continue our dialogue um, with China, but we also have to prepare for any sort of strategic contingency. And that means we have to build up our military capacity. I don't think we're going to see a 1944 D-Day style invasion by China of Taiwan. The Chinese could win it, but it would cost them dearly and, and their military capability would be severely hit by the American forces that sit in South Korea, Japan, Guam, Alaska and Diego Garcia. The United States plays a major strategic role in the Indo-Pacific. With 375,000 personnel, there's a vast network of operations that extend from Hawaii all the way to India. Jim Molan believed China's first course of action would be 
to aim big. So what is your code red warning? My code red warning is a, is a surprise attack by China uh, on American facilities in the vicinity of Taiwan. So you think they'll neutralise the enemy, so to speak, uh, outside of Taiwan before going into Taiwan itself? Uh, correct. I believe they will neutralise the Americans, dominate the Western Pacific and say to Taiwan, OK, Taiwan, OK, Japan, OK, South Korea, are you, gonna are you really going to fight us now that the Americans aren't behind you anymore? And I've been saying that we should prepare for a war between China and the United States with us as collateral, not the main aim, we're collateral. And fundamentally, the Chinese now have the capability to take out uh, all our communications and uh, space capabilities across the entire spectrum of space. Uh, the, use of, the use of space and communications in the military at the moment is absolutely critical. When it comes to space, China was late to the game, but has very quickly caught up. Their ambitious space program now leads the world in annual rocket launches. China now has more than 360 satellites orbiting the Earth. The Chinese are rehearsing and practising this all the time, taking out the, the world's, not just the Americans, the world's satellites up there. Uh, they're rehearsing this all the time. If they took out the world's satellites, the undersea cables, if they attacked American military bases, which are not fortified in the, in the American bases around Taiwan, then there is nothing the Americans can do. If Australia was to get involved in any potential war here in Taiwan, would we then potentially get attacked from Chinese forces? China won't be able to attack Australia unless they have Taiwan. That's for sure. So, but once Taiwan is done, then Australia could be the next target. From a military point of view then, are we ready for war? I don't think we are. A case in point is our active Defence Force personnel. <laughs> Combining its one million troops with other personnel, China has over two million. America, around 1.4 million. Australia, 60,000. There's a plan to get us to 80,000. Is that enough? Growing the Defence Force by 20,000 people over the next two decades, that's a, that's a big target. And we definitely need the people to crew submarines, to, to conduct cyber capabilities and operations, uh, to do a number of the emerging jobs that probably don't exist yet, but will in 10 years or so. But I think recruitment and then retention is the biggest challenge we face in the Defence Force. How weakened have our defence forces become? Well, it doesn't take long for a military organisation to lose readiness when it's not able to practise what it does. A more immediate issue for the ADF is its current state of readiness. In recent years, nearly one third of our defence forces have been tied up with natural disasters and the COVID pandemic. When we respond to uh, large-scale disasters here and overseas, it takes away defence assets. And when you have large amphibious ships and large parts of the army cleaning up after floods, fighting bushfires or overseas, they're not able to train for what is their principal role, which is to be a deterrent against threats against Australia or to respond to those threats in a military way. Right. Whose fault's that? Well, obviously, it's the government. I mean, they're the ones who make these calls. That probably was not the right thing to be doing because we now have a military that is a lower readiness than it needs to be. Ready or not, the ADF now faces major challenges. We do need to be thinking about whether or not the defence force we have now is, is fit in, in terms of the strategic landscape that we face, and it is very different. Um, there is much greater threat. We must have the ability to project, to project sure. power. We need to be able to hold any potential adversary at risk 
uh, at greater distance from our shores. Which brings us to submarines. Our current crop have arguably reached their used by date, so replacing them is now a top priority for the Albanese government. The AUKUS arrangements are progressing and we continue to undertake uh, cooperative discussions with the United Kingdom and the United States. The first major initiative of AUKUS... AUKUS is the security pact that was set up between Australia, the UK and the US in 2021. I think what that does is it represents a unity in the Pacific that is absolutely critical in dealing with North Korea, in dealing with China, and in dealing with other threats in that region. In terms of AUKUS, how important is it that that proceeds as planned? Critical. I think we'd lose a massive amount of face if we didn't proceed with AUKUS, but it's not about face, it's actually about capability. Nuclear submarines will provide that, in addition to our surface fleet. Uh, but absolutely critical, and it will also more closely integrate us with the US and the UK. Under the Three Nation Agreement, Australia has committed to buying a fleet of eight nuclear-powered submarines. Some estimates put the cost at above $100 billion, and the delivery timeline more than a decade away, possibly up to two decades. I think the nuclear submarines are a very good idea for a really long, long-term uh, objective. But what are we going to do next year or the year after or in five years' time? Should we be getting subs that are off the shelf? Is, is that something that should be considered? Oh, absolutely. I think subs off the shelf is, should be part of the plan. In fact, we should be doing it concurrently. But my view is that we should be building our industrial capacity here and we should also be seeking to get two boats off a production line out of the US, if not the US, then the UK. We are thinking about the next few years. We're thinking about the 2030s and the 2040s. Right. We're thinking about what the world might look like over that period of time. And in a sense, the right analysis is to look at the worst case scenario and make sure that we have a defence force that can maintain our way of life um, over that period of time, no matter what we Sure, face. OK, but, you know, China's certainly getting ready for war. It seems to be on a war footing at the moment. What we need to do is to make sure that we uh, maximise our defence force posture so as to protect our interests. The AUKUS Pact will also beef up America's military presence in the north of Australia. We recognise uh, where Australia is and, and, and how, uh, when its capability begins to, uh, begins to diminish. Uh, and of course, we will address all of that in that pathway that, that, we, that we create. Uh, and so uh, we will not allow Australia to have a capability gap going forward. America has long used Australia as a key strategic outpost. There's Pine Gap, a spy station that's believed to provide signals intelligence and early warning on missile launches. In WA, the radar facility near Exmouth provides critical communication links to US and Australian naval forces in the Indo-Pacific. The Tyndall Air Force Base is used by the Americans and Marines are routinely stationed in Darwin. Now, there's more to come. We will increase rotational presence of US forces in Australia. That includes rotations of bomber task forces, fighters, and future rotations of US Navy and US Army capabilities. It's a clear um, example of how the Americans are thinking about the importance of um, the strategic geography of Australia and of specifically of the Northern Territory. John Coyne is with the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. This isn't a new thing for them. So we look back to the Cold War, Pine Gap was put down, but Australia was important then. But its importance has, has grown significantly. Now, for a couple of different things, there's pure geography about this. Um, it's about distances, so it, in a simple military planning, it's the Goldilocks location. Close enough to the Indo-Pacific to be meaningful, far enough away from, um, from most threats to be struck and um, 
uh, destroyed or, um, or disrupted. At the end of the day, a conflict between the United States and China would be nothing short of catastrophic. It would not be a short war, and we should be very clear about that. The economic fallout for Australia from a war to our north would be catastrophic. Shipping lanes could be blocked. Vital supply lines could be cut off. Our nation could quite literally be brought to its knees. We're an island nation. We rely upon a lot of seaborne trade. Uh, and it's really, really important that, you know, those lines of trade are protected because without fuel, we've got big problems. Australia relies heavily on fuel imports. Nearly 90% of it comes from overseas. Any disruption to those supply lines would have a far-reaching effect on our everyday lives. Fuel disappears. Trucks don't go to Coles and Woolies and other important stores throughout the regions. And of course, our pharmaceuticals run low. The bottom line is we don't have enough fuel. Aircraft don't fly. Food doesn't get moved around the nation. Trains don't move. Everything just comes to a slowly grinding halt. John Coyne says it's not just about keeping the supply ships moving, it's also about keeping them safe. If we needed to escort um, every exporting or ship exporting Australian goods and raw materials, um, then we wouldn't have um, enough warships to do that. So therefore, um, the security of the nation, the economic prosperity of the nation and our day-to-day -day life would be impacted by that. Um, do we have enough warships to escort all the fuel and liquid fuel reserves to come in and out of the country that we would require to continue on and prosper? Um, especially if someone was to threaten those, then the answer to that would have to be no. On the world stage, tensions between China and America are again on the rise. While all the talk is about Taiwan, could the two superpowers go to war over a balloon? This was clearly in breach of America's airspace. Uh, and and that's, that's the fundamental thing. Whatever it was doing, um, it was in American airspace and it didn't have uh, permission to be there. The giant Chinese balloon that floated across America and was taken down over the Atlantic Ocean is further evidence that war is just a hair trigger away. China is not going to give us a year and a half's warning on this as the Japanese and the Germans gave us in World War II. In fact, they've already given us warning. As you, you, you talk to any of the strategists around the place, we are well and truly within the strategic warning time for the next war. Australia is one of the best friends we have. The Albanese government has got to come up with a strategy and just do it. This is the front line between democracy and dictatorship. Ultimately, they want to control Taiwan. Anyone who bullies you knows there'll be a cost. They'll, they'll get a punch in the nose. This is the front line between democracy and dictatorship. This remote Taiwanese island, dwarfed by mainland China, about two kilometres over there. The region is a powder keg. Xi Jinping has threatened to take Taiwan by force. And if so, that would lead to war, extending far beyond these shores. They're called the Kinmen Islands. While mainland Taiwan is 160 kilometres away from the Chinese coast, from here, China is plain to see. And this place is no stranger to Chinese aggression. In the 1950s, Kinmen was heavily attacked during the second Taiwan Strait Crisis. 
bunkers from back then still dot the island today. In 1954 and 1958, in both occasions, China just launched the uh, artillery shells uh, on Kimoi uh, without even sending uh, a single troops to land there, but it still caused tremendous damage. Ever since, Taiwan has maintained a military presence here. So would Kinmen Island be the first place to go down? We do not know, because that really depends on how China will do. In the capital, Taipei, locals are also uncertain about what the future holds. I believe if uh, China attack Taiwan very soon, maybe one day or we'll finish. But most agree on one thing. At some point in time, China will make a move on Taiwan. I believe that it is inevitable. You believe it will be inevitable that there will be forced conflict. Yes, as long as Xi Jinping is still assuming office. Yes, there's a concern about the wars happening probably in the future years. A war happening here? Yes. There yeah. is concern about that. Yeah, yeah. You have that concern. I have the concern. So I think our freedom will be taken away, just like what they did to Hong Kong. Why do you think that? Because I think ultimately they want to control Taiwan, including its politics and um, all aspects of life, the dissemination of information and so on. Hands up, who would fight? Who would fight? Nearly everyone. The least thing we are ready to do is to use force. And that is one of the reasons why China has been so patient. But we can never uh, rule out the, our option to use other means. So when necessary, when compelled, we are ready to use all necessary means. As to what does it mean by all necessary means, you can use your imagination. Against all this talk of conflict in our region, Australia's Defence Force is under intense scrutiny. It's called the Defence Strategic Review, a once-in-a-generation look at whether our ADF is fit for purpose. In other words, is it ready for war? And for the Albanese government, it's a critical moment because decisions that are made now will decide how we meet security challenges in the years ahead. Australia needs to be in a stronger position in the future than we find ourselves today. Uh, that's why we're doing the Defence Strategic Review. Yes, Prime Minister, this is the product of six months of work and um, I think it addresses all the terms of reference and uh, we're very pleased with that. Thank and, you. Uh, this very... is the most significant piece of work in 35 years, yeah. at least. Yeah. The Albanese government has got to come up with a strategy, figure it all out and just do it and pay for it. Regardless of whatever kind of blowback might come from the public. Well, I think ultimately uh, the public will come alongside. But at the, at, the, at the moment, no government is putting to them that we've got a significantly increased defence. And those that do uh, say, oh, yeah, China, yeah. But what does it mean? OK, it now is the time for real plans and real expenditure. Zero, 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 three, over. When it comes to defending Australia, Jim Molan says today's military is simply not up to the job. Many of us in the military over about the last 15 years or so have well and truly seen that we were losing our conventional warfare capabilities. We have a defence force which has never been better for the kind of wars we fought for the last 80 years. That is where we could choose when we go, what we take. We don't have to actually win the war, we just have to be there. We can choose when we come home. 
Well, those days are pretty well past. They might occur again, but it'll be subsidiary to the main strategic challenge, which is defence of liberal democracy in our part of the world with our American allies. Andrew Hasty is another who knows about being in the firing line. He also says our defensive capabilities are in need of a major reboot. Sure, we can deploy as part of a, you know, a larger coalition, but could we defend ourselves for an extended period of time against a peer adversary or, or someone even bigger than ourselves? I'm not so sure. And for that, we need to have a strong deterrence. And that's, I think, what we're missing right now in our defence force capability. So what do we need to deter right now? The way I like to put it, I always come back to the schoolyard. We've all been bullied. You need to make sure that anyone who bullies you knows there'll be a cost. They'll, they'll get a punch in the nose. And I think um, what we need to, to build, therefore, is, is that deterrence. And that deterrence will come at a cost. The current annual defence budget is $48.7 billion, or 1.96% of GDP. Many argue that to properly defend Australia, spending has to dramatically increase. The Australian government needs to talk to the Australian people about the kind of threats it faces. I think the last couple of years we've done some of that, in particular with the Chinese coercive activities. Uh, but it needs a, a more compelling narrative to convince the Australian people that they need to spend more on defence. We're never going to be able to match the Chinese military machine, though, are we? Never. But how far short are we? What, in your view, do we need? Oh, I think, I think we need to at least double our defence expenditure. Others have said 4%. Would you go that high? I, again, you can't really put a figure on it. I would say we must spend what is necessary to secure our country based on the strategy that we lay out. But as things stand at the moment, it seems like 2% is not enough. I don't think 2% is enough. It needs to go up. I, th I think it is important that we, we are having a conversation with the Australian people, which, which makes it uh, clear um, that we live in a world which is, which is more fragile than we have for a very long period of time. And, th and that what that is going to require um, is, is a defence posture and a defence force, which, which is, in truth, going to cost more than it has in the past. We're going to need to increase our defence spending. The late Senator Jim Mullen had suggested it should be up near 4%. That's how serious the threat is on our doorstep. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, take, we take what Jim Mullins says seriously. You know, not for a moment do we take any of this for granted. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot of money being spent on capability which needs to be explained to the Australian people. The growing shadow China is casting over the Indo-Pacific, has already seen one major country lift its military spend. Japan will double its defence budget within five years. At $320 billion US, that'll make it the third largest in the world, exceeded only by America and China. It is natural for Japanese people to be awakened to the new security reality facing us. Do you think they are awake? They are. Yes, that is why you know, this idea, you know, new national security you know, uh, policy strategy is strongly supported. This is an unprecedented development in Japanese national defence strategy. Building Fortress Australia will not only be expensive, it will also mean convincing the Australian public that it needs to be done. Do you feel like the defence strategic review should shock the country into where we're at at the moment and what's needed to be done to get us ready for something that we don't want anyway, but it's best to be prepared? That's right. I, I think the DSI, if it does its job well, will educate the Australian people. It won't be just limited to people in Canberra or the, the public service, but all Australians will have a better understanding of Australia's strategic circumstances and that of the larger Indo-Pacific region. Not talking about just how many dollars, talking about uh, where are our assets, are they the right assets in order to defend ourselves in 2023 and beyond. So you've already seen substantial announcements from the Commonwealth in areas such as increased missile defence capability, 
uh, but we'll have more announcements arising out of the review. What do you expect the Defence Strategic Review to tell us? Uh, I, I am very cynical of it. Uh, I, I see that parts of the Defence Strategic Review are being leaked to journalists. If you come out and say, the Defence Strategic Review wants missiles and drones, hang on, are we only going to fight one kind of war, the kind of war that requires drones and missiles? OK, if that's the case, we can get rid of the land army and put all that money into drones and, and missiles. And, of course, that's come out as well. People are leaking to journalists in relation to that. So I don't hold great high hopes for it, but I, 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 I pray that they will get it right. While Australia's defensive future remains to be seen, the people of Taiwan are already taking matters into their own hands. Just in the past six months, private shooting lessons have nearly quadrupled. I'm sure that most people don't want to go to war. I also don't want to go to war. But in the unfortunate event of this really happening, I will be mentally prepared. Is there any way reunification could be peaceful? Uh, I think the only way that unification is going to be peaceful uh, is when the Taiwanese people uh, thinks that uh, uh, unifying with China is good for us. Uh, but I don't see that yet. Uh, Taiwan is already a democracy and all major decisions need to go through um, democratic means. And for right now, the Taiwanese people see uh, one country, two system model is not admirable. And in the public opinion surveys, one after another show that uh, the people would prefer status quo and not unification with China. So with the Chinese government continuing to want to superimpose their one country, two system model on Taiwan, I, th I don't think it's going to work. If war does come to our part of the world, there is one thing we can be certain of. Our alliance with America and the responsibility that comes with it. Australia is one of the best friends we have in the Pacific and in the world for that matter. And that if there is a decision between the United States and Australia that we are going to work together in order to defend Taiwan or if we're going to work together to uh, confront uh, North Korea or if we're going to work together to confront China, uh, I am very confident that uh, the United States and Australia will work together to determine how best each country can contribute to whatever security mission we decide is important for both countries. I'd say to every Australian, what we take for granted in, in the, the, the sovereignty and freedom and prosperity of this country should never be taken for granted. Uh, I understand the day-to-day -day issues that Australians face, but governments must lead the Australian people and they must lead them to understand what we have and being able to assure the Australian people that we are defendable. <laughs>